uh, for DC and Singapore, the time difference has made it slightly more difficult for people to, um, to accommodate the schedule. But I think we have, um, we have plenty of people who have joined. So we'll, while we wait for people to, uh, to trickle in, um, I think we're going to start the proceedings for today. So thank you very much for joining us today for the discussion on Chinese infrastructure development in Southeast Asia. So I'm sure this is an issue that a lot of us have followed very closely. And um, we're going to have a very insightful discussion today with, uh, with three authors who just completed a very interesting book on this topic. So for the event today, um, the hope is to focus on how the geoeconomics of Chinese infrastructure development influences the domestic situations of the recipient countries, as well as the geopolitics of the region. There have been many accusations and controversies associated with the mega Chinese infrastructure projects, including debt trap diplomacy, schemes for asset takeover, exacerbation of the domestic fragility of recipient countries, as well as uh, social and environmental degradation. So um, the research that um, presented by our three speakers today has revealed a far more nuanced picture that the recipient countries are not completely powerless and in fact possess significant leverages for negotiation. And in the end, it is the convergence of the domestic legitimacy and developmental needs that promotes the acceptance of the Chinese infra infrastructure projects. This raises a series of uh, serious questions about the policy implications. So in particular, um, do we believe that Southeast Asia, especially the mainland Southeast Asia, is uh, being absorbed into the Chinese orbit and such a geopolitical sphere of influence might be inevitable given how much China is spending in the region. To discuss these issues, we have three excellent speakers who just published their research on Chinese infrastructure development, especially railway development in, in mainland Southeast Asia, to give their uh, most fresh perspective from the region. And their book, Rivers of Iron, is what I would recommend for all students of China studies, of Southeast Asia studies, and of the relationship between China and Southeast Asia. To begin with, we have Professor David Lampton, who is a professor emeritus at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And he just recently finished a uh, fellowship as a research scholar and Oxenberg, Oxenberg Roland Fellow at Stanford University's Asia Pacific Research Center. He's the author of many books, including Following the Leader, Ruling China from Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping. After David, we have Selena Ho, who is an assistant professor and chair of master program in international, a master in international affairs program at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. She is the author of 30 Cities, Social contract, uh, Contracts and Public Goods Provision in China and India. Our third speaker is Qing Shui Kuo, who, who is the Associate Professor and Head of the Center for Asian Studies at the Institute of, uh, the Institute of Malaysia and International Studies at the National University of Malaysia. Uh, Ching Shui is also a non-resident fellow at, my for, uh, at the Foreign Policy Institute, Sais Johns Hopkins University. So after the initial remarks uh, by the three, mm -hmm. um, by the three, um, Three speakers, we're going to invite my colleague, Brian Eiler, who is the director of the Southeast Asia program here at the Stimson Center to provide some short comments and remarks. As I'm sure everybody knows, our Southeast Asia program has been dedicated to the Mekong water issue in mainland Southeast Asia. And his perspective on the hydropower development, which is deeply associated with the Chinese infrastructure spending in the region, will be particularly relevant to the discussion today. As for the proceedings, what we plan to do is uh, during the first section, we will invite Mike, Selena, and Qing Shui to give their remarks on Chinese infrastructure development in the region. Then after the initial remarks, Brian, I will turn to you for your comments for about five to seven minutes as a discussant. 
the uh, Q&A function of this meeting will be on throughout the, uh, throughout the session. So if you have a question from the, um, if you in the audience have a question for one speaker or for the, the whole panel, please feel free to raise your question as you, um, as, as they come along. We have somebody who is monitoring the incoming questions and will be uh, organizing them and uh, read them out to our panelists. So I hope this sounds okay. Thank you very much again for joining us today. Um, with that, I will hand the floor over to Mike. Thank you, Yun, and uh, thank all of you for either staying up late or getting up early as the case may be. Uh, we really appreciate your interest in a topic we've spent about five years working on. So we'll value comments and I look forward to the discussion. Uh, I certainly want to acknowledge this was a, a large scale comparative collective effort and um, quite frankly could not have occurred without I think three authors with rather different backgrounds that collectively pooled their various strengths and weaknesses uh, to come up with what I hope you will think is a balanced and uh, insightful set of uh, uh, observations in the first case and conclusions in the second. I want to thank uh, Yun and the Stimson Center for putting this together. It takes a lot of effort. And Brian, uh, thank you in advance for your uh, questions, observations, and uh, we look forward to your uh, remarks. I do uh, want to thank the University of California Press uh, and its editor, Reed Malcolm. Uh, uh, Reed has uh, been a long time as uh, associate and help to me and, and, uh, and in this case, our entire team in helping uh, 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 put a formulation on the topic and the questions that spoke, we hope, not only to the interests of specialists, but also to generalists and comparativists uh, across a broad range of geography and topics. So I wanna thank the University of California Press. Also, because this uh, project really involves seven Southeast Asian countries on the, the mainland of Southeast Asia, plus uh, we found ourselves uh, working on Indonesia to some extent as well, plus China, not to mention all of the multilateral organizations and so forth, we had to cover a lot of territory uh, it was a protracted, as I said, five-year process, and uh, that required funding. And we certainly want to thank the Smith Richardson Foundation and Stanford and SICE uh, for the support, uh, financial and otherwise, that they gave this entire uh, project. Um, I would say uh, just in terms of purpose, when you spend five years of your life, as we each have, uh, looking at a topic, you you have a kind of underlying uh, purpose. And I think that underlying purpose is revealed in the dedication uh, to this, this book. Um, there's been, as of course, we were going throughout the project, the notion of decoupling and, um, and um, uh, diversifying uh, uh, product chains and so forth became increasingly vigorous topics of discussion. And while in certain strategic areas and in certain production chains, I'm sure there will be uh, decoupling or at least loosening up uh, the uh, uh, reliance on others. And we see this in recent meetings in China and of course in discussion in the US. Uh, this book is really dedicated to the proposition that building connections is the future and building walls is the past. So I think in this particular era of COVID and of course uh, changing in a, a negative direction relations between China and the United States uh, emphasizes the forces pulling us apart. I think this book is dedicated to the proposition that over the long run, connectivity and interdependence are by no means dead and will be the broad mainstream in the medium term and more distant future. So this is about connectivity and its implications for geoeconomics and geopolitics. Um, this book is about, uh, starts out addressing the subject about how China in, let us say, 1999, 2000, had virtually no high-speed rail industry had, in terms of producing the hardware, it had no, uh, 
high-speed rail domestic network to speak of. And over the space really of a little more than a decade, uh, build an industry from the ground up. And it was a Manhattan scale, a Manhattan project nuclear weapons scale kind of uh, undertaking involving dozens of research institutes, heavy subsidies, acquisition of technology all over the world. And in a very real sense, Xi Jinping didn't build this industry at all. It was his predecessors. He inherited a set of capabilities that then he applied to his larger BRI vision, which we, we will come, uh, come back to. But this is really the story about how China acquired the technology, built the domestic industry, then built the capacity to not only build projects internally, but to export that capacity uh, around the world, of which our area, Southeast Asia, is one of six economic corridors. Now, this vision of connectivity, we, we tend to attribute at this point, and I guess in our sort of thinking, that, uh, that Xi Jinping is the driving force of uh, everything. Uh, and in some sense, as I'll point out, there's a reality to that. But this vision of connectivity running from uh, China down to Singapore and railroads, uh, the vision that's expressed in the map, and I'll explain it in a second, uh, this was not a Chinese vision. This was not a Xi Jinping vis vision. In fact, I suppose if you had to kind of trace as we do back to where the vision came from, it was probably the night, it was the 19th century British and French colonialists who from their perches in what was then Burma, uh, of course, India, and the French in Indochina wanted to connect and penetrate Southern China, particularly the gold being Sichuan, which they saw as a very rich, wealthy potential area that was not really accessible from China's coast where most of the treaty ports were. And so the colonialists wanted to build up into Southern China, approaching China from its a uh, soft underbelly. So uh, that was certainly, I think, the colonial kind of impulse. And then during World War II, the Japanese uh, found that their shipping was getting sunk in the Pacific Ocean, South China Sea, Straits of Malacca area. And they wanted to build overland rail routes from really up near Japan to Korea, down through China, through Indochina, uh, and uh, avoid the sea lane. So the Japanese contributed to this vision, particularly during the uh, Second World War. After the Second World War, then the, uh, the, uh, the formerly occupied countries, both by Britain, France, and of course, Japan, began to gain liberation and build their own governments and put in place modernization plans. And very early on, the Southeast Asians themselves wanted to build a connectivity structure that would link them together. And one of the enduring features of ASEAN thinking uh, the Association for Southeast Asian Nations has been connectivity. And as recently as 2010, a major uh, plan for connectivity rail, importantly, uh, came out of ASEAN. But it has a long history, and it's been supported by the Asian Development Bank in particular. Uh, the Japanese uh, are quite supportive of elements of this. And so what we really see is in the most recent time since uh, Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, 2013, is that there's been a convergence between Chinese capabilities and the vision, long-standing vision of Southeast Asians and others. In other words, in a very real way, this is a kind of a Southeast Asian train upon which a increasingly financial ca financially capable China has jumped. Now, of course, now that it, particularly with the initiation of the Belt and Road Initiative in late uh, 2013, uh, China brings to the table now a whole generation of uh, increasingly capable technology, engineering talent, uh, financial wherewithal. And for the first time, you have this con convergence really of Southeast Asian desire and Chinese capability. Uh, in the of our um, 
interviews and we interviewed in about 150 different organizations. We talked with uh, the then former uh, Prime Minister of Malaysia, Mahathir, and he recounted talking to Jurong Ji in the late uh, 1990s uh, and was uh, interested in getting the Chinese to sign on to this vision. Uh, at that point, Jurongji said, well, let me assure you of one thing. Uh, we're going to build trains in China before we do in Southeast Asia, and China is not right now financially or technologically capable of doing what needs to be done. A mere 13 years later, and Xi Jinping comes along, China's capabilities have increased dramatically. So one of the interesting things I believe in the book is simply the description of how China used industrial policy to drive forward a really remarkable program. When I, I emphasize the remarkable and speed and so on, I don't mean to say there aren't any problems uh, and we'll certainly discuss those, but just to recognize what has happened in terms of scale and speed of development in both the, what we we'll call the transit countries, the Southeast Asian countries and China, I think is really quite uh, remarkable. Now this book concerns itself with a broad array of questions. And I think it's balanced between the attention it pays to Southeast Asia on the one hand and certainly China on the other. Uh, the first major question is, this is a, re if you look at this map, you'll see there's a hub up in Kunming. Uh, in southern China in Yunnan province. And basically from that Kunming hub, you'll see a couple of things. One is that there are arrows radiating to the rest of China. That hub will hook Southeast Asia into about 29,000 plus a thousand kilometers of uh, high-speed rail plus the conventional rail system in China. So one feature is this really hooks Southeast Asia into an extensive system in China. Second feature is that out of that Kunming hub are radiating really three north-south uh, lines. Uh, if you start in Kunming and sort of on the left of the map going uh, uh, west, you see it hooks into Burma, goes through Mandalay when it's built. This is a vision not entirely realized by any means at the moment, but the vision is Kunming to Mandalay, down to Yangon, uh, Rangoon, and, and then to Bangkok. The second uh, north-south line there is Kunming down to, through Laos. It's called the central line down to Bangkok. Uh, and then the third one is to the east, uh, southeast, from Kunming to Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh City, Phnom Penh, Bangkok. You'll see that all three of those lines then hook up at Bangkok and go down to Singapore on a basically common line. If you take each one of these lines uh, from Singapore to Kunming, you, each of which each of these is longer than the American Transcontinental Railroad. So the thing you, you will note is that this is a huge engineering task. If you look at it in terms of numbers of, uh, uh, well, the geography through which all this goes, uh, just to give you an example in Laos, the Laos link from the border of China at Boten down to the Mekong Vientiane, uh, that 70% of that mileage is bridges and tunnels, just for example. Also during the war, enormous amounts of ordnance were dropped by the US uh, bombing campaign in Laos, uh, trying to stem the tide of invasion as the Americans would have called it from uh, North Vietnam at the time. So you've got a huge engineering task here. And of course, if, that, if the book was about nothing other than just building the line, I think it would be fascinating. But the underlying questions are really political uh, that uh, at least substantially interest us. The first is, can China do it? Uh, the political task of welding together the visions of seven Southeast Asian countries with changing governments, various economic levels, various governmental systems, uh, continually changing leadership, uh, all of this is a huge political task. And the issue arises, can China do it? 
And of course, China has foreign policy that doesn't always make all these countries particularly happy, particularly the maritime countries, Southeast Asia. So uh, they've got sometimes their foreign policies working against their foreign economic policies. So question one is, can China do it? Certainly another is what set of problems does China encounter, or and for that matter, the partner countries in South Asia, Southeast Asia, what problems do they encounter in implementation? So the book relates to a vast and I think interesting literature on policy implementation. Certainly another question is as this vision gets implemented, and I should say right now what you've got is uh, moving from Kunming on that central line down to Bangkok and then Singapore. I think this line will probably well, will the first link to Vientiane will be done in December of 2021. I believe that's a pretty hard date. Uh, certainly, uh, I would think within five to seven years, that line will be to Bangkok, and then there's some uncertainty. So uh, that's the most developed part of the uh, construction that's underway. There's a little bit uh, in Thailand and the prospect of hooking up in Thailand, I think, is increasing. Uh, but uh, it, it, Wang Yi, the foreign minister of China, was just recently there. So what's most developed here is the Kunming down towards Bangkok leg. The other, the east and the west lines, more tenuous. Uh, but uh, I, I believe over time that they will be implemented in various stages. So if this line gradually take, these lines gradually take place, that gives rise to the question, how's it gonna change the geoeconomics and the geopolitics of not only the region, uh, not only Southeast Asia, but Asia more broadly, and of course, how will it affect powers, whether it be India to the West or Japan to the North or indeed the United States and Europe? So the question is, what's the impact as this progressively materializes? Uh, certainly another uh, issue that arises from that is, uh, what does this mean for building what I would call a stable balance of power? And in the book, we call for balance connectivity. China has the vision of trying to build north-south connectivity. Uh, rather than oppose that or try to consciously present problems for its realization, we're suggesting that the West and particularly the United States think about East-West connectivity, running from India to the Pacific Ocean across Burma, across Thailand, uh, Cambodia, Laos, and uh, Vietnam. So what it raises the question of how should the United States be thinking about, and not only the United States, but our partners throughout Asia start thinking about uh, all of this. I will just end up by saying, as, as you can see, there are a lot of questions, a vast territory, uh, uh, at least um, eight con different countries involved in the research took a long time. We interviewed in over 150 organizations, both localities in each of the countries, uh, central governments, private companies, multinational companies, multilateral organizations like the ADB, World Bank, and so forth. So it was a massive undertaking in which we relied substantially on interviews as well as documentary research. If you were to ask the question, could we do this research the way we did you know, over the last five years, now, particularly given the deterioration of US-China relations, uh, I would anticipate we would have not the great cooperation we in fact had uh, from China now. I think uh, we're all gonna have to think about strategies by which we can um, try to understand China, but uh, not only from China within, but increasingly, we're going to have to find ways to study China intelligently from outside of China as well. So we hope that this book uh, represents a kind of template, or at least one way to think about how research, comparative research, uh, cross-national research can occur in this new era. With all of that, uh, I would like to ask Selena Ho from uh, Li Guan Yu School to uh, pick up where I left off. Selena?
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, Sun Yun, Brian, and Stimson Center for organizing this. Uh, thank you very much. And also the audience for attending today. Um, so to pick up from what Mike was uh, talking about, um, one, of the, one of the most interesting perspectives from the book and which what makes, uh, what, that makes the book unique is that um, uh, we really have uh, a view from Southeast Asia as well. So unlike you know, uh, most books on the BRI, uh, which either focuses just on China itself or maybe uh, the recipient countries, um, what is unique about this book is that it actually brings the view from China as well as the view from Southeast Asia. And in fact, four to four, chapters four to five, four, four, five and six, three chapters of the book actually focus on uh, responses from Southeast Asia. So um, I'll be covering uh, what happened during the negotiation process, what, uh, how did China and uh, Southeast Asian countries negotiate? Uh, and what the other, the other thing I'll be covering is what are the challenges to um, the construction of the so-called high-speed railway? And Cheng Tree will follow up on some of these uh, domestic uh, politics and Southeast Asia issues as well. Now, um, so one of the things that we discovered in our research, and I think that um, especially for Cheng Tree and I who live in the region, is that small states actually really have agency when it comes to this. Um, there are, uh, there, as we do our research, there is a significant amount of pushback from um, parts of Southeast Asia but the ability to push back uh, really depends on a number of conditions. Um, and in particular, there are three conditions that determine the bargaining power of smaller states as they negotiate with China. The first condition is uh, size, wealth, and location do matter. So you have middle powers like Indonesia and Thailand who have greater leverage than say Laos uh, in, and they are able to bargain for better terms for themselves. For instance, Indonesia was able to get the Chinese to agree to no sovereign guarantees, which is that um, the, this, this means no sovereign guarantees means that the, the Indonesian government does not uh, need to be responsible if there is uh, the, the project fail. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's what is known as a loan guarantee. So Indonesian government does not need to do that, okay? They guarantee the loan. And they also managed to negotiate for a lower interest rate. Um, and then you have uh, countries like, like Thailand where geography gives it a significant advantage. And this is where the map, if you look at the map, um, all three routes, the three routes of this Pan-Asian railway vision, actually um, uh, Thailand is a keynote. All of them will have to run through Thailand. So this gives, uh, this geography, uh, Thailand's geography give, gives uh, Thailand tremendous <clears throat> leverage when it bargains with China. In fact, in one of our interviews, a uh, key government advisor actually described Thailand, and I quote, as a beautiful woman who can wait to choose the best suitor. So basically the suitors refer to the great powers that come wooing at her doorsteps. Um, for Laos, geography is definitely not an asset. It can be bypassed to the East and the West by Vietnam and by uh, Myanmar. In fact, in our interviews, there are significant anxieties in Laos among Lao officials that they would be bypassed. Um, you can read all these uh, interviews that we get, uh, that we have, um, uh, we, the interviews that we conducted in these countries, uh, you, you know, the, the, we let the interviews speak for themselves in the book, okay? The book is full of these interviews and interesting anecdotes, so it'll be, make very interesting reading. Now, the second condition that determine the bargaining power of smaller states as they, as they negotiate with China is state capacity. Secondary states really have more options when they have greater capacity such as uh, robust government institutions, rule of law, uh, transparency, civil society, human resources, as well as the ability to regulate and to monitor. Uh, Singapore, is, for, for instance, has state capacity and is not overly dependent on China economically. That helps it, uh, when it when it bargains with China. However, countries like Laos are heavily reliant on Chinese economy and technical expertise. For instance, the feasibility study for the china Lao. Uh, railway was actually conducted by the Chinese themselves. So in this way, the, the integrity of that report of the feasibility studies actually in a way um, opened the question and in a way compromised as well. 
Now, the third condition that, that gives bargaining power to smaller states is actually the domestic conditions, the domestic politics and public opinion uh, play a large role here. Now, Ching Chu will actually go in deep, uh, deep details here, but let me outline some key points as to pertain to bargaining. Well, if we think of bargaining as a two-level uh, game, and if you recall uh, Robert, Robert Putnam's uh, two-level theory, well, you have the first level, right, which is the international bargaining level, and the second level uh, is bargaining among domestic agencies, including public opinion. So leaders like Najib and Jokowi, um, uh, Najib, from, a former prime minister of Malaysia, and Jokowi, the current president of uh, Indonesia, have been attacked for selling their countries to China. And there are concerns uh, over whether locals will actually benefit in terms of technological transfer, job creation, and also Chinese companies often bring in materials from China and in this sidelines local SMEs. There is thus this really big question on whether economies of host countries actually benefit. So negative public opinion and unhappiness over Chinese presence assert uh, significant pressures on leaders in, of these countries. So if we come back to the two level theory at level two, which is the bargaining that's happening domestically, the wind sets for Southeast Asian politicians are actually quite small. So this ironically actually strengthens the bargaining position when they negotiate with China at the international level, meaning they can actually tell China, look, I'm putting my domestic position here at risk. You have to give me more concessions. Now, let me turn to the challenges of, of implementation. So as Chinese companies venture into Southeast Asia, they encounter problems and issues which, which they are not familiar with and when, when they operate within their own country. Uh, there's a lot of tra uh, trial and error and learning involved. Not that there, is no, uh, that there are no problems with implementation within China, but the problems actually multiply when these companies encounter a different political system with a very confusing array of uh, stakeholders, actors, and veto points. For instance, uh, let me give you some examples here. Um, they encountered decentralization politics in post-1998 Indonesia, um, especially when it comes to uh, land acquisition for the construction of the high-speed railway. Now, land acquisition is actually the first step of the process, but there were significant delays in land acquisition and the project was uh, de delayed for several years as a result. So uh, with this, let me, let me explain this a little bit more. With decentralization post-1998 uh, in Indonesia, uh, the center has actually weakened while the regencies were strengthened. So when the Jakarta Bandung Railway uh, was being negotiated, it was a government, national government to national government negotiation, uh, which does not actually uh, involve the local governments. So when the Chinese companies try to acquire land from um, local regencies, they actually encountered resistance. So in, in total, 29 districts and 95 villages in West Java are being directly impacted by the HSR construction. So you can imagine the amount of difficulties Chinese companies face as they deal with powerful local authorities and the very strong land tenure laws in Indonesia. Now, another factor that has hindered implementation of bureaucratic resistance this is the case uh, of, uh, this is case of, uh, in, this is what happened uh, primarily in, in Thailand. For example, the state railway um, of Thailand makes money by selling land, but loses money on all on rail operations. Hence compensation for the loss of land is actually a key issue when uh, the, the Thais negotiate with the Chinese. There are also significant legal obstacles to the construction of Bangkok Nong Kai. Uh, which borders on uh, with Laos, uh, HSR, uh, laws that offer labor protection, procurement standards, land usage, and environmental protection. So the, these actually slowed down the construction of the, of, of the project. And Prayut actually, uh, Prime Minister Prayut, Thai Prime Minister Prayut actually had to invoke Article 44, which is an executive order to overcome some of these legal barriers. Now for another point that I want to make here is that for any infrastructure project, and especially for railways, which cross many jurisdictions, having a champion is actually very important. In Malaysia, for instance, um, former Prime Minister Najib was a stalwart champion of the East Coast Railing and the Kuala Lumpur Singapore High Speed Railway. However, he lost power in May 2018 uh, general elections. 
And uh, as a result of his um, having to step down from as prime minister, these projects actually lost a very powerful patron. And there, it was almost sculpted subsequently by Mahathir. Mah uh, the the um, Mahathir 2.0. Um, uh, he, Ma Chengdu will elaborate on, on this a little bit more, but basically Mahathir put these projects on hold, but he later renegotiated for better deals and um, uh, terms for themselves and the project started again. Now in some, what, I'm, uh, what I want to say here is that there are actually significant challenges that China experiences as it ventures into Southeast Asia, whether in terms of when they are negotiating terms of the contract or when constructing the HSR themselves. Um, I will now turn to Cheng Chui, who will elaborate more on the diverse responses of the Southeast Asian states to China and their geopolitical and geoeconomic competition with other major powers. Cheng Chui. Um, thank you, Selena, and uh, good morning or good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Building upon uh, what Mike and uh, Selena have uh, presented, let me first address the issue of how and why different Southeast Asian countries have responded to China's real world diplomacy differently. And uh, towards the end of my presentation, depending uh, on the time that I have, I would uh, make a few points about the uh, geoeconomic and also geopolitical implications of China's wider Belt and Road Initiative uh, in the region. So in chapter four, we have these uh, two times two uh, metrics uh, that illustrate um, how and also uh, explain uh, why. Let me deal with the issue of uh, how and uh, before elaborating on the issue of why. So the four quadrants that uh, before you that you could see here represents uh, basically uh, the issue of how in the sense that illustrate four patterns, four types of uh, small state responses. And even though here we focus uh, primarily only uh, on four ASEAN countries, Laos in quadrant one, Malaysia quadrant three, quadrant two, Thailand quadrant three, and Vietnam quadrant four. Even though the, the cases here are only four, but clearly the four patterns that illustrate can be extended into a wider group of uh, countries in the region. And in fact, I would argue it also uh, represent different uh, type of responses uh, for smaller states uh, responses towards big power back uh, infrastructure development project. So for quadrant one, Laos, it represents uh, the type of uh, response that can be uh, labeled as enthusiastic embrace. And quadrant two, receptive, but with a uh, cyclical recalibration. So in the case of Laos, we know that uh, by the time uh, in uh, late 2016, when uh, the party leaders have uh, decided to make the final decision, and when uh, the groundbreaking ceremony was held in Luang Prabang, the decision was uh, stick and uh, stable and uh, we know that construction uh, has been ongoing uh, since then. And even as we talk uh, in light of uh, COVID-19, we know that uh, the schedule was uh, more or less uh, uh, on schedule and then uh, it's going to be completed by uh, the end of uh, next year, December, 2020, December uh, 2021. And uh, in the case of Malaysia, it's uh, also similarly very receptive, but the difference between uh, one and two is that unlike uh, Laos, which is uh, very stable, and the Malaysia is a receptive, but is a subject to cyclical recalibration. As I mentioned by Selena early on, the moment when Mahadira come back to power in 2018. So one of the first things that he did was to suspend a number of China back related, uh, China back uh, infrastructure projects, especially East Coast railing that is very, very controversial. So, but uh, once the, the renegotiation was done uh, next year in 2019, we saw that uh, again, Malaysian successive uh, leaders under different uh, governments, even uh, this year, under a different uh, government uh, led by Mohidin of a pre Katana National, Malaysian continued to be very receptive responding to uh, China railway project and also uh, the larger infrastructure projects. So quadrant one and two represent relatively receptive and uh, stable. And in comparison, uh, we see that uh, quadrant three and four, it's uh, less receptive more cautious and uh, to some extent, uh, even uh, keeping the distance. So Thailand, quadrant three, although uh, Thai uh, elites uh, under the military uh, regime, prior to the government, has uh, engaged China in a railroad project uh, in the form of um, a Bangkok uh, Nong Kai uh, project, high speed rail. But we knew that the process has been uh, taking a long time. So uh, in a matter of a few years, growing our fuel, we uh, have uh, heard about 
uh, almost 30 rounds of uh, negotiation ongoing. And then uh, in reality on ground, only 3.5 kilometer of phase one of a Sinotire high speed rail has been uh, uh, co co constructed uh, so far with uh, still uncertain uh, 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 prospect about the phase two from Korat to Nong Kai. And in the case of a quadrant four, Thai, uh, Vietnam, it's a very limited uh, involvement. We know that the only uh, China related project, uh, railroad project in uh, Vietnam is uh, only in the form of an uh, urban uh, city uh, rail in uh, Hanoi, which has been uh, expanded, uh, extended and also delayed for many times. So now the issue of why, what reasons uh, explain all these uh, different uh, responses? There are two variables that uh, we thought that we have, uh, uh, that have uh, really uh, explained the different uh, responses. So those two variables are represented along the two axes on these two times two metrics. So the first variable, legitimation, it's the main variable. So in this case, we identify development-based legitimation as the primary reason that explain why Laos and Malaysia, and if you like other countries like Cambodia, are relatively more receptive about China backed or foreign backed uh, high speed or infrastructure projects. And because of, for them, development issue is not just economic issue, but political uh, issue. And performance legitimation, economic growth is the source of their political uh, legitimacy. And uh, they are, they are, the, they are the, the ruling elites that would therefore respond uh, and receptive about China led uh, railroad projects. In comparison, for in the case of uh, Thailand and Vietnam, even though development uh, legitimation is also important, but there are other equally, and if not the more important uh, pathway of legitimation that convince Thai elites and also a Vietnamese elite to pay attention and keep distance from uh, China. So in the case of Vietnam, it's uh, anti-China nationalism. So it's another type of uh, pathway of legitimation. It's a uh, particularistic uh, legitimation that offset the importance of development legitimation and hence convince uh, uh, Vietnam uh, leaders to uh, keep distance from China and also a China-led uh, infrastructure uh, partnership. And in the case of Thailand, even though Thailand, we do not see uh, the kind of uh, anti-China nationalism in the case of uh, Vietnam, but in Thailand, the Thai identity, Thai autonomy is a big factor that underpin uh, successive uh, Thai elites uh, legitimacy and also uh, authority to rule and hence, precisely because of uh, Thai military leaders has been perceived as depending too much on China in the light of uh, the isolation by the Western government, the more the reasons that uh, Thailand need to uh, keep some distance. So during a few work, lots of uh, Thai elites have been telling us that this is Thailand. We want to do things our way. So they were pushing back a lot of uh, initiative put forward by China. So that is the primary uh, factor, legitimation uh, reason that uh, uh, explain why differ, these uh, different ASEAN countries have uh, dif responded uh, differently. But this variable has been uh, uh, intervened by uh, the second factor, which is power pluralization. And uh, this is something that uh, Mike uh, has uh, worked on uh, for his uh, earlier work on uh, China, uh, power pluralization in the sense that uh, how political power is uh, uh, centralized or decentralized among uh, the competing elites and also uh, state society uh, relations. So in the case of uh, Southeast Asian countries, we do see that the degree of power pluralization, whether or not power is uh, centralized or pluralized, does uh, affect the kind of uh, attitude that ruling elites uh, have. So in the case of uh, Laos and Vietnam, once decisions are made, the decision will stay and stable. Unlike in the case of Malaysia, that decision has been contested by different competing elites and also even the bottom-up expectation. Something similar that happened in Thailand as well. We see that the competing elites have also have an impact to constrain the extent to which Thai elites can make decisions in negotiating with China when it comes to a sino thai high-speed rail project. And with the remaining time, let me uh, make a few points about the um, geoeconomic and also uh, geopolitical uh, factors. So we will need to understand uh, the dynamics uh, from the perspective of uh, smaller countries. Eventually, it's about demand and supply. So smaller countries want to uh, have, want to uh, demand for some partnership and resources that would help us to construct infrastructure that high-speed rail. But the options clearly are limited in the sense that 
on our own, we cannot really uh, build the kind of infrastructure that we need. The, the existing uh, uh, Bretton Woods uh, institutions clearly are also limited in uh, providing the funding. And hence, Belt and Road provide the kind of uh, uh, funding resources that are needed, demanded by smaller countries in the region. However, during our, peer, during our field work, we have uh, noticed that uh, when it comes to supply, China does face some uh, competition in the form of uh, Japan's uh, partnership for quality infrastructure. So throughout much of our field work research uh, writing uh, process, Japan's uh, scheme seems to be the only alternative uh, scheme in competition in competing with uh, China's Belt and Road projects. But towards the end of our book project, we are, uh, and especially uh, 2018, there was a time that we see uh, more alternatives in the sense that EU has uh, announced uh, EU Asia connectivity. Even the uh, US who used to uh, say that connectivity uh, infrastructure is not our game, it's not the game that we will play. Towards the end of 2018, we saw that uh, Washington has also uh, passed the Build Act. And among the quadrilateral, uh, the quad uh, member states, we saw that uh, Australia, India, and uh, together with Japan has also uh, come up with a number of uh, either bilateral or minilateral uh, kind of a package that provide some alternative, even though it is uh, still uh, too little and perhaps a bit uh, too vague uh, by the time we speak. But uh, so far we have uh, uh, read the news about alternative uh, projects, like for example, the Blue Dot uh, Network, for example, uh, the Economic Prosperity uh, Network. So all this, I think, uh, is uh, driven not just about your economic uh, considerations. Clearly, it's a, a larger uh, response to uh, geopolitical uh, factors, meaning that to push back China and uh, to provide the kind of alternative to smaller countries in Southeast Asia and also uh, beyond. With that, uh, I will stop my presentation. Back to you, uh, Yun or Brian. Thank you so much, Ching Shui, Selina, and, and Mike. What a marvelous project. And thank you for the great presentation and also offering the nuanced understanding of the issues related to the identity of the projects, the agencies of the smaller Southeast Asian states, and also the determinants of their agencies. I think what you have presented offers fertile ground for policy recommendations as for what other powers could do to diversify the available, available options for the countries in the region, and also how to create a more balanced uh, power in terms of infrastructure projects. We have received many questions specifically related to the presentation and the content of the presentation. But before we turn to the audience Q&A, Brian, could I turn to you for your comments and impression of, uh, of this project? You have focused a lot on the Mekong Dam issues. And one question that I do want to raise is whether you see the sino laos Railway as an example of death trap diplomacy, as China has gained the majority share of Laos national power grade earlier this year. Actually, I think it happened in September. So um, Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Uh, I'll try to keep my comments uh, short so that we can have enough time for Q&A and discussion. Um, but congratulations to the authors for um, a really uh, pointed and uh, useful look into China's exporting of its high-speed rail industry to Southeast Asia and the rest of the world. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've lived in China for 15 years. I first went in, in 1998 as a, as a young person studying in college and immediately began to take advantage of the rail system, traveling uh, over that period uh, by myself to the frontiers, uh, numerous frontier points of China um, from Beijing, uh, and then eventually um, through running a study abroad programs for American college students, they're taking them uh, on trips to Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia and Yunnan. Um, in the end of my time there, we were taking students by rail to Southeast Asia and uh, from Kunming to, to Hanoi. Uh, and interestingly, I think it's because it's not a high-speed rail link. Um, uh, the team doesn't look at that particular uh, rail linkage, the newer developments of the rail linkage, but takes a deep dive into the historical development of this rail from Kunming to Hanoi, which is well over 100 years old. Um, but now you can wake up in Kunming, um, have a slow breakfast, jump on a railway um, to uh, Hukou in southeastern Yunnan province, cross the border by foot, and then jump on a uh, train to Hanoi and have dinner, a, a, a relatively early dinner in Hanoi. And uh, so it's interesting to see 
uh, how these railway connections are coming together, noting that that particular linkage is still not connected. And coming back to Ching Shui's uh, comments about the quadrant, we can see that Vietnam has been very passive uh, in terms of linking up though that, that linkage. Again, that's a standard rail linkage, um, China's new line to Hukou moving into uh, Vietnam. But to the book, you know, of, of many must-reads that have come out in 2020 um, for China and Southeast Asia, uh, many of which we've been promoting here at the Stimson Center, this book clearly sits at the top of my list. And, and what sticks out is its theoretical framework, specific policy guidance, and then a deep dive into China's political economy, as well as the political economies of the seven countries in which you examine China's export of high-speed rail into uh, the book also benefits from time. Uh, there's now been about a decade of development uh, in China's high-speed rail export sector to examine. It's still much that China wishes to accomplish with its export of high-speed rail uh, and the industrial policy that underpins it. And um, the book answered numerous questions for me. I just want to uh, uh, focus on a few. One is that it, it lets us know what is the state of the internal debate about China financing Belt and Road projects abroad, uh, as well as the foreign policy promotion of those projects abroad through the lens of high-speed rail. And, and Mike, in many, ways, in many ways, it reminds me of your article, A Plum for a Peach, which um, uh, an early time during my graduate school uh, experience uh, helped me think about how water negotiations happen in China showing that there is a variety of uh, informed opinions, motivations, and veto powers that work within China that can move projects forward or change the specifications depending on the intended outcomes. Um, interestingly, uh, one takeaway was that the Lao Rail Project, the China Lao Pro Rail Project, was supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in China and the Ministry of Commerce, but not the Ministry of Finance. Uh, and interestingly, it's, it's, it's China that's paying a, uh, the, the greatest portion of the, uh, the bill for that rail, even though Laos has taken on a, a fairly large loan to support its own equity portion of, of the rail. Um, so you're showing a wide range of informed opinions among think tank researchers in, in China in the book. And thus we can also assume among officials and party members that there is no iron consensus on the Belt and Road. And that just helps to kind of widen and, and create space within the discourse. Another important question is how do projects come to fruition? Um, the book answers this. And what determines success, failures and change of, of the various projects that you examine? Um, I found the chapter on implementation very useful as it shows that the deals that are said to be done aren't necessarily done uh, and discusses internal and external factors that lead to project delays, cancellations, or, or key changes to their project details and specifications. And then finally, um, and importantly, the book answers a question of why and to what extent do individual Southeast Asian states view other powers and players as credible alternatives or supplements to Beijing in their own railroad construction. Um, I think this in and of itself uh, is a topic of another book and encourage you all to, to write that book or to find authors to inspire to write that book uh, about uh, Japan's uh, uh, intentions and motivations for railroad construction uh, in Southeast Asia and the other external powers that you discuss because this book is needed now that great power competition is really ratcheting up in the region. Um, further, uh, Ching Shui's uh, last slide is going to be really useful for me uh, in, in my own work moving forward to think about the legitimation versus pluralization of power uh, and state response to external inducement. I often get a question from the media and other researchers um, uh, from foreign service officers of, uh, thinking about civil society reactions in to infrastructure developments and civil society's ability to force outcomes in Southeast Asia. And I often go around the map talking about the difference between Thailand and, and Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam. Um, but that, that spectrum, um, that, that matrix um, really will help me focus, I think, in the future on providing a more um, informed answer um, because often it is a conversation of, of state inducement, state power, as well as uh, pluralization down to civil society uh, and civil society's uh, influence uh, within a country. And, and also um, the Belt and Road, uh, this book is just a great 
opportunity to, to take a deep dive inside of the Belt and Road uh, and to help kind of um, sand or, or refine some of the, the various aspects of the multifaceted discourse that has emerged about the Belt and Road. Um, you know, China often presents the Belt and Road as a very shiny object. I think here in Washington, the object is presented either with, with spikes or time bombs attached to it, or, or at least warts, right? Warts and all. And um, I, I think that your book um, provides a way to see how China talks about the Belt and Road, um, the way that policy circles can and are discussing the Belt and Road in Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and provides uh, uh, guidance on how academic research should be done um, on Belt and Road uh, uh, research, uh, particularly in other countries. And kind of a final um, comment is that I think your book is the first book to take a sectoral approach to the Belt and Road. And the choice of rails is an interesting one. You, you could have chosen hydropower, you could have chosen coal export, you could have chosen 5G or, or social governance export. Um, but the, the rail association shows a network, right? And it shows a network with China at the center. So that the middle kingdom analogy is, is front and center throughout the entirety of, of the book. Um, and, and you examine you know, the, the difficulties, uh, the, the feasibility, uh, the possible future, uh, uh, yes, up or down, yes or no, of that potential uh, China at the center of a, of a massive train network. Um, and uh, you, know, you do have a quote in the book saying, from an interviewee saying that all roads used to lead to Rome, but now they lead to China. Uh, and you provide perspective and, and kind of rebuff that interviewee a bit in the book. Um, the, the book provides an approach that creates linkages, again, to other sectoral examinations. And I do hope that readers and researchers do take the opportunity to use the book as a template. And Mike, I'm glad you used that word template for future examinations at the sectoral scale. Um, and with Southeast Asia, you, the needed areas are within that power generation sector. So work can be done on coal export, or, or, or hydropower export or looking at um, China's solar industrial policy. And it's something I've been a long proponent for of, of importing China's solar uh, capacity abroad as an alternative to some of these more damaging uh, um, projects. And, uh, and again, this, this approach could be applied to um, sectors like IT, Huawei expansion, social governance methods as well. Um, there's a lot to say uh, about this book. I, I do want to kind of bring my comments to a close. Um, one quote that is uh, uh, mentioned throughout the book is the saying from a Chinese stakeholder of, if you want to get rich, you have to build roads. And how numerous stakeholders in Southeast Asia have bought into that discourse. But importantly, we need to think about who gets rich and at what cost. Um, and environmental and social impacts of projects, uh, particularly at the community level, um, going a bit deeper on this would have been a useful augmentation of your work. Uh, and just noting that this is something that could be further explored. Um, the Mekong region is rich in natural resources, which underpin economic security and drive growth in the, the region. We can think about agricultural productivity. We can also think about how tourism is uh, such an important sector for economic contributions in, in these countries. Um, so infrastructure can either undo uh, uh, deliver impacts that undo uh, some of that natural resource availability, or if it's smartly planned, can help um, continue to have natural resources underpinning economic security in these countries. Um, and then uh, finally, um, just a few questions to think about is, I was surprised that the discourse of the Asian Development Bank was kind of underplayed or, or maybe not examined as much as it could be, um, because it was the ADB's GMS program that kind of brought that century old discourse back into the, to the forefront of railway and transportation development. Um, so if there's a chance uh, in the discussion portion, we could talk about a little bit more about the ADB's role. Uh, and, um, and then finally, You've already hit them, Yoon, but I'm curious to see what the top level recommendations for U.S. policymakers are. Um, as U.S. policymakers are thinking to engage in infrastructure uh, sector development in, in ASEAN and the Mekong um, and reconsidering its development finance approaches um, from which it really had taken a long decades long break from. And then finally, Mike, you mentioned in your uh, presentation that um, 
would the current state of US-China competition allow you to um, uh, communicate with Chinese stakeholders in the real candid uh, and frank way that, that you collected information during your interviews with Chinese stakeholders? Could that be done today? And um, if not, how can we continue to, again, um, uh, generate real local knowledge and opinion uh, to inform our policy discourse here in Washington? And what have we lost uh, through the deterioration of US-China relations? Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for your comments. I think you raised a lot of interesting questions that probably will pave the ground for the next book by our by our authors. And especially the research question as well, how research will be done down the road is, uh, is a key one. Um, so now we're going to move rapidly into the, the, the Q&A, the uh, audience questions. There have been a lot of questions. And um, so to begin with the first, the first round um, to Professor Lampton, there's a question about that trap diplomacy. So while connectivity is a very positive proposition to all, the question centers around China gaining an undue economic and strategic advantage, as well as whether these developing countries can service the debt. So what are your thoughts, uh, Professor Lamchen? And this is related to another comment about Barry, um, Nor Nor Barry Norton's comment that uh, since transport, transport by sea is cheaper than by land, the overland portions of the BRI will create expensive land connections to relatively small economies that already have alternative transportation options. So uh, Norton's conclusion is that these overland projects are unlikely to have a high payback to the Chinese economy. So I thought could combine that with the debt trap diplomacy question, does these expensive projects benefit the um, transit countries and China? Uh, a question to Selena about the um, issue of uh, local dissent to the projects that we're seeing. So the question is, what exactly is there, why exactly is there resistance despite the government's promotion of these projects? Is it because they do not create promised local jobs? And um, also a question to, uh, to Ching Shui regarding the four quadrant topology, how would Singapore, Indonesia, Myanmar, and the Philippines, these four countries fit into the, uh, the the, um, the typology and the analysis. So Professor Lamchen, may we uh, start with you? Thank you. Thank, thank you and thank you uh, all for the, the questions. Uh, I'll drill in on uh, Barry Naughton's questions because there were several there and I can't do them all justice. And in, But I would start by saying he's asked the key questions. And while I think we provide some avenues to answer them, there's a lot more that could be both be said and more research and knowledge to be gained. So uh, uh, first of all is uh, the whole question was raised of the cost. Uh, and uh, it particularly is maritime transportation for many goods is cheaper. That, that's right, there've been many studies done on that. Also, I would just say in talking about high-speed railroads and so forth, there are ver various speeds and there's a trade-off between passengers and freight so it gets very technical very quickly. Uh, and freight operations often are quite uh, profitable, but the higher the speed of the train uh, isn't necessarily the best for freight operations and so on. So there's a whole uh, uh, cottage industry of trying to find where the optimal is. But in terms of the balance between land transportation and maritime transportation, I think there are two considerations. First of all, you have to ask why China's doing this. And partly China's building off, it's move, trying to move up value added on its industrial manufacturing chain. And as it does so, it's offloading, you know, parts production, lower tech, lower vi, uh, uh, value added to Southeast Asia. And rail and particularly rail freight uh, transportation makes more sense when you're start, talking about building an integrated production chain system for, uh, that feeds into China. So I would say that's the first thing. But I think the most fundamental question is when you talk about revenue or does a project pay, you have to define what, you, what, what are the outcomes that you think are valuable. And uh, ticket sales or freight revenues for many Chinese are not the only, I mean, in the government and in decision-making rules is not the only thing. 
they are uh, looking at, you know, you could look at reduction of carbon emissions per, uh, and shipping's not so clean on, on carbon emissions. You can look at uh, the use of executive time. You look at the uh, uh, urbanization patterns that develop around the railroads. And so the question becomes, what do you see as pluses and minuses in a very big and often abstract uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis? And so what I would say is the Chinese have a, a, a broader vision. You, it's often asked, is this a strategic meaning military security uh, motivated or is this economically motivated? And the answer I think is both. China's domestic growth is slowing. It wants to build export markets and richer, more urbanized uh, nodes of population to its south. And Southeast Asia is growing very rapidly. So China thinks it will have uh, do better economically if its neighborhood is richer. So this is, and the China, this gets to that build a road and you'll get rich idea. The Chinese basically think if you wait to build infrastructure until what we might call the accountants think there's a positive cash flow, you might never build it. On the other hand, if you build the infrastructure, then development and urbanization begin to build along those lines. And in this sense, I think it's very important. The Chinese are not pushing against the inclinations for the most part of Southeast Asians. Uh, they're pushing against an open door because on this point, almost every leader in Southeast Asia agrees with the vision that infrastructure has to run ahead of growth. So uh, Barry, you've asked all the important questions. It's all debatable, but I think it boils down to what, what's your cost benefit analysis? And this gets to the underlying vision that I think, you know, uh, that the Chinese have. And there are debates about it. There's a whole chapter in the book about Chinese debates. But basically, I think they think that um, if their neighborhood gets richer, they'll do better. And secondly, there's a vision of China as the hub for Asian economic growth and resource flows. And that vision making China the hub for these leaders at this time uh, is the overwhelming benefit I think they're looking at. So um, I agree there's debates over costs of maritime and land transportation and so forth, but I don't think that's the level at which uh, this has at least been fought out in the Chinese elite. I would just end, there's, a, as I said, a big chapter on debate. Not everybody shares this vision. In fact, many economists in China thinks it is not paying sufficient attention uh, attention to uh, reasonable rates of return. Thank you, Professor. Selena, how about the question about the local opposition or the local resistance? Well, okay, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that, um, uh, let me say, but that there actually is a very complex uh, situation and what's happening within these countries. There is actually a divide between how elites the national governments uh, feel and think and view these projects. Um, they th the, these, these projects actually uh, are, in, uh, are in line with the visions of the elites. But it is a different case when it comes to how the masses view these projects. Uh, public opinion plays a large role here. Uh, there are several aspects to this, right? So people are not convinced about the risk of the project and the high cost of the project. In the end, uh, people are not convinced that uh, the project is going to be beneficial for them in the long run. I mean, if you, if you look at the Jakarta Bandung Railway, it's only 142 kilometers. Um, and you know, it's a very short stretch. Why do you need a high-speed railway? So one of the questions is, asked, why would you need a high-speed railway from Jakarta to Bandung? They're not convinced that economically, economically it's gonna make sense. Uh, obviously, just now I mentioned local governments have not been consulted, so they have to give up land, land which could have been used for other forms of development, uh, or they, you know, they and they're all strange. Uh, this very strong land tenure laws in Indonesia, so uh, these these are kind of resistance you face. Well, uh, obviously the job creation is one of them. Uh, for example, in Indonesia. Uh, 
the high speed railway is supposed to create about 20,000 jobs. Um, we don't have information whether 20,000 jobs have actually been created. In fact, you know, you have a total, the, uh, I have a number here. Uh, there has been a large influx of, large influx of Chinese work, work permit holders, the numbers of whom actually jumped by 30% between 2015 and 2016 to a total of 21,271. Now, if you were to put that in context, the number of Japanese laborers in a, in a country is 12,000. 490. American workers in Indonesia is about 2,812. So this large influx of workers is uh, it not only does it, you know, uh, raises the question of whether jobs have been created for local people, but it brings certain tensions within society. It adds to communal tensions uh, in, in some parts of Southeast Asia, in particular, where um, the, the Chinese, uh, ethnic Chinese groups have been uh, uh, have been suspicious. Uh, there have been suspicions about local Chinese ethnic groups. They are links to the mainland. So all these bring about communal tensions, especially in a country like Indonesia, which has you know passed racial riots. Um, and and the other thing is, it's also a law and order issue. Um, in, when we went to Cambodia, the casinos are famous there, right? So the casinos are usually run by the Chinese gangs, and they create a whole lot of criminal issues. And in, in places like Sihanoukville. Uh, and, you know, I mean, this is no fault of the Chinese government per se. Beijing has no role in these people, uh, you know, these Chinese people coming in from tier, tier three and tier four con uh, provinces into C Cambodia. They come in, they run their businesses, it creates a law and order issue. So it's, it's a mix of uh, different negative uh, public perceptions um, about these projects. And of course, there are uh, people who feel that, you know, Chinese quality, uh, infrastructure quality, uh, the, the, the technology is not as good as the Shinkansen, for instance. So there are questions about all these things. Yeah. Thank you, Selina. Um, Ching Shui. Yeah, thanks for the good question. And perhaps uh, to make things easier, uh, Selina can help us to uh, uh, pull out to show uh, the two times two metrics again. Um, so the question uh, clearly is good in the sense that uh, it allowed us to show uh, about the applicability of these uh, two by two uh, metrics into uh, other cases. But one big point uh, has to be uh, made uh, at the outset before I uh, get like uh, different uh, countries into uh, different boxes. The point is that uh, here we are focusing about as uh, what Brian mentioned earlier on, is a sectoral approach. So we focus primarily on the real or high speed real uh, project. But uh, these metrics, clearly can be and should be uh, applied to uh, other types. In fact, uh, all kind of uh, infrastructure projects. And since the question, uh, it's uh, mainly focusing on Belt and Road. So uh, let us uh, take all these uh, countries into uh, all these quadrants, but uh, bearing in mind that uh, my elaboration examples are primarily with uh, the broader type of uh, infrastructure projects in mind, and it's not limited to uh, uh, high-speed rail or rail projects because in certain countries, their collaboration with uh, China's Belt and Road is not limited or does not uh, really manifest uh, in the case of uh, high-speed rail. For example, the, example, the, the, the instance of uh, Singapore. Singapore uh, and actually is not only like uh, not involving rail, but in fact, uh, the collaboration is also uh, not uh, within uh, Singapore, but it's actually in China. So taking in the form of uh, the Chongqing Connectivity uh, Corporation. But so Singapore is in quadrant one, very enthusiastic uh, embrace collaborating with China in terms of uh, Chongqing Connectivity and also uh, the new uh, um, international land and sea uh, 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 corridor, uh, and also financial connectivity. So uh, Singapore will be in quadrant one, and uh, given the uh, PAP's uh, uh, governance, clearly this is a decision is very uh, centralized and also a uh, top-down. And in quadrant two, I would say that uh, Myanmar under the lady, uh, Yuna, you would uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I would uh, safely uh, suggest that Myanmar under the lady, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, is uh, under quadrant two, very receptive, but because of the nature of the polity in Myanmar, uh, it's a subject to a psychical recalibration. So uh, if and when the lady or different uh, leader come into play, we would uh, expect to see uh, some recalibration, some uh, changes, yeah? And then uh, Indonesia would be a very much uh, in quadrant uh, three, even uh, Jokowi was very receptive, but there are other competing pathway of legitimation. In this case, anti-China, uh, nationalism with the limit, the degree 
as to uh, how far Jokowi uh, would want to collaborate, embrace uh, China back uh, projects. So, and it explained uh, why you are so, uh, I mean, throughout uh, Jokowi's, uh, Jokowi's uh, two terms, Indonesia has collaborated uh, only uh, very selective uh, type of uh, infrastructure with China. And then uh, uh, quadrant four, I would say uh, Miam, uh, Philippines before Duterte, uh, uh, under uh, Aquino, uh, it's a, a very much a limited involvement. So uh, because of uh, the sentiment on South China Sea. So uh, that sentiment uh, about South China Sea, anti-China nationalism, again, uh, will limit uh, the extent to which the Philippine uh, elites uh, will want to go. Duterte clearly is an exception. He make a decision based on uh, his own uh, judgment. He put aside the arbitration of South China Sea, and he thinks that his political uh, legacy will be defined primarily by two domestic agenda. One is about the uh, drug war, and then uh, the other one is about build, build, and build. And on both counts, China will play a bigger role, which explained uh, under Duterte, Philippines is very much in the quadrant two. But again, I would say that would subject to a recalibration. I will stop here. Thank you, Ching Shui. Thank you. Um, well, unfortunately, we have run out of time and we have to come to the end of our session. Although we do have many more questions, especially on regional economic framework and how those frameworks such as RCEP or CPTPP or even ASEAN will advance the, uh, the bargaining power of the regional countries and how that shapes the geoeconomics of the region. But um, Mike, Selena, and Ching Shui, I want to thank you for your insightful comments today, and thanks Brian for your um, for your discussion of the book as well. I hope this is only the beginning of inquiry into this fascinating fields of Chinese BRI, Southeast Asia's agencies, and we look forward to future studies and insights from the from the authors. For our audience. Thank you very much for getting up early or staying up late today. And thank you for, for your insightful questions. So please join me in thanking our authors, our scholars, speakers, and our discussion today. And please do remember to join us for our future events and future discussions on China-Southeast Asia relations. Um, with that, 